You may know Fujifilm as a trusted leader in endoscopic equipment, but we have recently evolved to become a complete endoscopy partner from screening to treatment for all kinds of endoscopic procedures. The acquisition of the endotherapeutic device manufacturer Medwork, now Fujifilm Medwork, has significantly increased the width and depth of Fujifilm's portfolio across the endoscopy pathway. For procedures in the upper gastrointestinal tract, which includes the esophagus and the stomach, Fujifilm offers its latest series of gastroscopes. They have excellent image quality, including multi-light technologies which incorporate LCI and BLI imaging modalities and enhanced optical magnification for improved detection and characterization of abnormalities. Even during challenging times like the COVID-19 pandemic, Fujifilm is continuing to innovate, helping to ensure safe and efficient procedures. Unique solutions such as ultra-thin endoscopes to perform transnasal endoscopy help to reduce patient backlogs while maintaining an excellent image quality. With a vision to become a complete endoscopy partner from screening to treatment, Fujifilm now also offers a wide range of therapeutic devices and endoscopic ancillary devices which enable physicians and nurses to perform a wide variety of procedures utilizing Fujifilm's innovative technologies. Solutions for hepatopancreatic obiliary, such as ERCP procedures, are also redefined. From special endoscope features supporting guidewire-assisted cannulation, all the way to stone extractions and other challenging procedures. Small bowel procedures, such as enteroscopy, require specific equipment to reach deep into the small intestine. Fujifilm's proprietary enteroscopy solution utilizes a specialist endoscope with double balloon technology, the gold standard in performing enteroscopy. It enables the physician to reach deep into the small bowel to perform diagnostic or therapeutic enteroscopy, supported by Fujifilm's new therapeutic device portfolio. Fujifilm's expertise and continual innovation is reflected in its solutions for the lower GI tract, starting with the unique CADI system, supported by Fujifilm's deep learning AI technology Riley, which enables computer-aided detection and characterization of polyps in the colon. When detection and characterization is successful and CADI has identified a polyp, for example a neoplastic lesion, resection can be performed utilizing Fujifilm's endotherapeutic solutions. For more information, get in touch with us via our website, fujifilm-endoscopy.com forward slash contact. Fujifilm, value from innovation. So good evening, everybody. I'm Cecilia Binda and I'm an endoscopy. I work in Forlì and Cesena Hospital in Italy. I have the honor to uh, chair this uh, symposium, uh, ESG symposium on uh, biliopancreatic endoscopy. We try, as you see, the agenda is very busy and we will try to get uh, the many, to touch many hot topics uh, on uh, biliopancreatic endoscopy. Uh, I have the honor to moderate uh, uh, such an amazing faculty. And as you see, the speakers are really outstanding. So first of all, I would like to thank ESG for the opportunity of uh, these uh, educational uh, programs and webinars that uh, has been led in five consecutive years and that always mm, gave the opportunity to uh, have high quality presentation and um, speakers from worldwide that are leaders in endoscopy. I would like to spend a few seconds because in order to make this symposium as much educational as possible, it is very important your interaction with the speakers using the Q&A box. And so please make questions. We will try to answer to all of them uh, during uh, the uh, discussion time. And uh, if this is not enough, we will type the answer. And we try so to answer to all the questions that you give to us. So please make answer. So let's go deep into the heart uh, of this uh, symposium. Um, so I introduce the first speaker, Geoffroy Bramberlier from Nice. Hi, Geoffroy. Hi. Hi, Hi. Cecilia. 
So you will talk about bile duct cannulation that probably is the first step for uh, biliopancreatic endoscopist, but probably is still the more challenging, uh, you know, procedure, uh, although it's the first step uh, and for all the uh, biliopancreatic endoscopy. So the, the chair is yours. So thank you. Thank you. The, the historic part of the interventional endoscopy, the URCP, thank you for this very nice and, and kind uh, introduction. And uh, just in a few words, I uh, wanted to, to, to have a special thanks for, uh, to USG and, and today to, to, to Fujifilm to always uh, the, the support for the, the education and the training in our field of uh, uh, the uh, therapeutic uh, endoscopy. So um, my, my first question when I, when I tried to prepare this lecture was why uh, URCP is always so, so mysterious finally, because sometimes it seems to be so simple and sometimes it seems to be so complex, so difficult. And one of my master uh, tell me a day, uh, you know, Geoffroy, uh, the URCP, it is three minutes or three hours. And it is sometimes like this. And I think that the first response is that there are as many papilla as there are uh, uh, several faces on, on the earth and all these different aspects of Papilla explained that the orientation inside the common bile duct could be different, difficult, or very simple and direct when you perform URCP. And finally, if we have just a few introduction on the different factors that could explain these difficulties, you have to remind always when you perform URCP, the anatomy of the papilla and the common bile duct and the propagatic duct just to understand where you have to go and the movement uh, should be from the lower right cutter to the upper left at 11 uh, o'clock. And for this, you have to use the bathing capability of uh, the papillotome. And you are always to remember when you have to cut to perform the sphincterotomy, all the different work which have been published on the vascularization of the papilla and always remember that the green zone, the green area is between 11 to 12 o'clock because it is a place where the vessel are the less number uh, in this part of our anatomy. Just a, a, a small slide to remember you the uh, four uh, basis uh, technique to perform papillotomy from the sphincterotomy which is uh, the first line technique using the papillotome with the guide wire most of the time to uh, the free hands uh, needle knife papillotomy, the, the fistulotomy or amphibotomy, and we will decide uh, depending on uh, the aspect of the amphibotum, but we will discuss that after. And the last technique, which is certainly uh, the most dangerous one, it is a transpancreatic uh, sphincterotomy. And uh, I tried to summarize before the video cases, uh, the, uh, the last guideline, uh, which are always good one, I think, at this time. And you know that after a, a failure of five uh, attempts uh, during five minutes, uh, it depends and you have to uh, uh, change your technique depending on the selective pancreatic duct cannulation. And if there is one, you have certainly to try to use the double guide wire technique. And if not, maybe the free hands technique or the suprapapillary uh, fistulotomy. So uh, let me uh, uh, show you a first video. It was a patient with a stone. And I, I want to leave you uh, the video without any wide break or cut because it's just to understand that sometimes the real life is for everyone. So here I use uh, the AX uh, tome uh, from MedWork to perform this procedure, which is very nice due to the very uh, thin uh, tip of the sphincterotome. And I start like I start uh, usually. It means that I try to have a good orientation at 11 o'clock uh, with the sphincterotome using the binding capability 
of the papillotome. I and mean, you can see that it was uh, difficult and it was first uh, a, a failure. Uh, even we try to use the, the tip of the guide wire and it could be an alternative to uh, introduce uh, your material inside the command backdot. You can use the, the only tip of the hydrophilic guide wire, try to, to found uh, the good uh, orientation and uh, uh, the, uh, the bioduct. So you can see that sometimes it is not so easy. Uh, you try to search, you wait, the famous number of five attempts before to change uh, the, the, the technique you want uh, to use. And uh, I just uh, speed a lot then to uh, show you that uh, after that, the second step is to uh, perform a little opacification, try to have an opacification, a duct opacification. And if it is uh, not possible, uh, you uh, 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 will change your technique for an alternative technique. It could be the free hands technique or the, the fistulotomy. Here you will see that during the second opacification we uh, will perform, we obtain the pancreatic duct. And in this condition, the second step is to introduce our guide wire in the pancreatic duct without any most uh, important opacification to avoid the risk of uh, acute pancreatitis. And when you introduce your guide wire, here it was the GPS wire from Medwork. When you introduce the guide wire inside the pancreatic duct, you can perform the double wire technique. So I just uh, uh, accelerate the video, the movie, to show you that now I have introduced the guide wire inside the pancreatic duct, and I will perform the double, the famous double uh, guide wire technique. And I think that the secret to, 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 to succeed uh, with this technique it is to, to bend a lot the papillotome because uh, the first guide wire in, in, inside the pancreatic duct um, uh, um, allow you to be more precise and to open the, the bile duct, but in the same time, uh, it is possible to be parallel to the first guide wire and you go always inside the pancreatic duct. So if it is the case like this, when uh, I try to perform the first attempt, you have to stop and then to have a, a more uh, important elevation with the elevator, bathing uh, of, the, of the papillotome to uh, uh, found uh, the uh, famous 11 o'clock orientation to be uh, inside uh, the common by duct. So I just left this, this the end of the, the video just to show you that, that I, I changed my position. I tried to bend a lot the papillotome and to just to have this better orientation like this, like this. And when you do, this movement, and you, sometimes you have just to pull a little the duodenoscope to introduce the, the tip of the papillotum inside the command by that. You can see that directly you go in the command by that. And then you can uh, uh, finish your, your procedure, do the opacification, ask, extract the stone. And we will, of course, uh, 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 put insert a pancreatic duct to reduce the risk of uh, acute uh, pancreatitis. Here, it was a second case. Uh, it, it was a structure of the command by duct uh, due to a pancreatic uh, tumor, cephalic pancreatic tumor. And I show you the different way to perform the free hand technique after uh, failure to accede to the command back dot. And here it is the orientation and the uh, right position to perform the uh, fistulotomy, just up to the papilla inside uh, the command back duct sphincter, the, 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 the bile part of the sphincter uh, uh, of the papilla of the ampoule. And like this, you will start, and I prefer to start when there is a bulging effect of the infant debilum. It is a type two or type three 
uh, of, of anatomical uh, classification. I try to use the fistulotomy because we know that with this technique, you reduce the risk significantly of acute pancreatitis because you are no in contact with the pancreatic duct. And me, I prefer to be very step by step. Uh, I want just to cut the mucosal layer, then to expose me, to expose the sphincter, and then if I need to put another impact of coagulation to introduce my guide wire inside the, the, uh, the sphincter. So, and I think it is a, a good way because if you do a large uh, cut uh, during the first impact, the risk is to induce a large and huge blading. And when there is a blading in this situation, it is impossible to introduce your guide wire. So um, always, even if you can do that with the needle, because the needle are sometimes uh, associated with three different lumen with a guide wire, which could be introduced using uh, the, the needle knife. I always prefer to use, again, a sphincterotome. It was the same sphincterotome as the XS uh, tome, uh, because with the, uh, tip or with the tip of the, of the guide wire and with the, the bathing capability, I could be more precisely placed to introduce the guide wire. You can see that it was not possible because uh, the hole uh, we performed inside the sphincter was not uh, too, uh, too large. Uh, uh, as requ required in this uh, situation. And this is the, re the reason because uh, uh, why I tried to, to, to perform another impact. And here you can see that we have a good access uh, for uh, the command button with some bile which is not, which, which is now uh, visible and uh, just have to introduce the tip of your guide wire and to, uh, to fish, finish your, 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 your procedure, uh, as you can see with the fluoroscopy. So it is finally easy if you, you uh, uh, are very step-by-step -step, uh, management of this, uh, of this procedure, and if you always respect the different step uh, like this, I think. But avoid always the blading, which could be very uh, difficult for the rest of your uh, of your uh, uh, endoscopy uh, if it is if it is the case. Uh, to finish, I always do a small papillotomy uh, before to uh, do uh, other uh, maneuver, just to be sure that the access is correct uh, to the command by that. So Cecilia. That's all for me. Uh, I hope that it will be uh, interesting, uh, especially it was the basis. It is the basis, but it was the topic of the, of the lecture. And uh, I hope that it will give some tip and tricks for our colleagues. So Geoffra, thank you very much. Uh, it was really interesting. And I believe for most of us are very didactical. So uh, I have one question for you. Uh, you show us uh, so many pictures of different papilla. So probably we never face uh, with uh, the same aspects of the papilla. Although, as we know um, from 2019, there's a, a main classification of the papilla, of the major papilla, the Scandinavian one, which is probably the most used. That is uh, um, that classif classify the papilla and. Uh, uh, estimate the risk uh, of uh, difficulties in, uh, in bile duct cannulation. And so uh, do you usually use this classification in, in your routine practice? And if yes, uh, how this uh, affect your management uh, of, the, of the procedure? You step probably, you go step forward uh, even before the, the five attempt uh, uh, to an alternative technique uh, or not, uh, uh, so which suggestions? Yes, it is, um, it is very interesting because uh, when I, I have a look on the different report from my colleagues and my friends, I, I have to confess that this classification is less and less used in France. I don't know if in other country, but, uh, and it, 
it is not a good point because finally we know that in high uh, score of the of the classification finally uh, if there is a bulging effect of uh, of the papillar for the infundibulum we know that uh, the fistulotomy presents a higher uh, technical success rate and uh, it is i think um, important to switch to fistulotomy in this situation and in on the other end, on the other side, when you have a small papilla, small, smooth, soft, and small papilla, the class is a class zero or one of, of this classification. Uh, we know that you have to switch or to use a double guide wire if you have an access, a pancreatic access during your first cannulation, you have to use it and to perform a double guide that were icing because there is a higher risk of technical difficulty as you mentioned uh, previously. And uh, maybe you have to uh, accept that you have to switch rapidly to exit to the command bile duct more uh, uh, easily, finally, easier uh, uh like when you when you when you uh, you respect this different step um, uh, finally i think and it is a good point you you said finally i think that you have to accept that um urcp is sometimes difficult and if it is after two or three attempts difficult you have the feeling that the the anatomy it is maybe different in this patient uh, try to switch to an alternative technique because the, 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 the acute pancreatitis after uh, URCP is mainly due to the lot of, uh, the lot number of access of attempt and of uh, um, uh, of different uh, uh, insertion of the guide wire you will try to do with the same technique so try to switch, to change your attitude, just to have some question and response. Sometimes it is good to have your fellow at your side just to discuss. <laughs> it is very good. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and to, to, to change your, your, your habit and your attitude. Yes. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate for your lecture and for your answer that ERCP is uh, a mix of stop, think, yeah but move rapidly to alternatives. So this I believe is the, the probably the, what really makes uh, working a, a team yeah. and in ERCP because there's always a matter of stop thinking, but you, you have to move rapidly to another, yes. um, you know, uh, another technique if the first fail. So we have a question uh, for, for you, and then we move to the second presentation after. If there are any other questions, we will try to answer at the end. Um, there's a question that asks, uh, when you go for the, second uh, for the second time into the pancreas, and you keep trying to cannulate uh, the bile duct, or you do the transpancreatic sphincterectomy and avoid the uh, repetitive attempts? If you go uh, inside the pancreatic duct with your second gu guide wire, it means that the, uh, you, are, you don't have any uh, bathing effect and uh, a bad orientation with your papillotum. So you have to change and to do a lot of elevation and bathing uh, effect with the papillotum just to change uh, the, 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 the orientation to be more at 11 o'clock and it, it will be a success I, I, I am sure I am sure the transpancreatic sphincterotomy clearly it is the end of the end for me it is a technique I will use in the in the last situation because we know that it is a higher risk of post URCP pancreatitis and uh, it works. It is not so difficult finally, but uh, the risk of acute pancreatitis after that is the higher uh, uh, reported in the literature. So you keep it for the last, the last uh, uh, technique if you are in, in failure situation. So I, I just make a provocative uh, a question. So when you cannulate the pancreatic duct, you and you know you have um, 
bile duct stone without cholangitis. You just, and you cannot cannulate the common bile duct. You reserve a second attempt of the RCP or you move to the transpancreatic uh, sphincterotomy? Um, uh, I, I, it depends from the anatomy of the infant debilement as we, as we discuss with the classification. If I have a bulging, with a large infant dibulum, I perform a transpancreatic sphincterotomy um, because technically it is easy. Uh, if you have a small papilla, I don't perform a transpancreatic sphincterotomy. I come back. Okay. Clearly. So thank you, Jeffra. We will see you. at the end uh, of the meeting for the final discussions. So it is my pleasure now to. Uh, present um, Dr. Srisha Herber from uh, the University Hospital of North Midran. Hi, Srisha. Nice, nice to see you. So the floor is yours with uh, the stone management basics and beyond. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to the ESG uh, and UG film. Uh, Right, so I'm going to talk about the, uh, the stone management. So we know that with the advent of MRCP and the endoscopic ultrasound, so the ERCP has become more of a therapeutic procedure. And thankfully, we don't use ERCP to diagnose uh, bile duct stones. And in this study, uh, which looked at the trend of in-hospital uh, diagnostic and therapeutic ERCP in the United States, we can see that in a, in a decade, there has been a a two-third decrease in the number of uh, diagnostic ERCP, the blue line, as compared to what it was about 10 years ago, uh, which is a good sign. So, but then the, 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 but we know that uh, with the advent of uh, imaging, so we are using lots of CTs, we are using a lot of CT colonography, we are picking up more and more bile duct stones in patients who are, don't have any symptoms. So is, his first question we need to ask is, is the patient affected by the bile duct stones? So we know that a lot of patients have gallstones and we don't go ahead and do an cholecystectomy for these patients. So if they don't have any symptoms, what do we need to do with this uh, bile duct stones in asymptomatic patients? So the guidelines with the ESG and also the BSG at the moment suggest that even with their low evidence that we should offer uh, ERCP uh, for the, these patients, even if they are asymptomatic. But the limited evidence, what we have at the moment, uh, shows that in this study, which looked at the natural history of asymptomatic bile duct stones, in those patients who had an intervention like an ERCP, they had a risk of pancreatitis about 20%. And in those patients who did not have any intervention and had a wait and watch policy, and they had a risk of cholangitis of about 20%. So on both sides, you have some risk with, uh, with asymptomatic bile duct stones. I'll give you uh, my personal uh, little bit of a story. So this was a patient with a 70 year old who had a chronic diarrhea and had a CT colonography, which picked up multiple CBD stones. She was completely asymptomatic. Liver enzymes were all normal. The diarrhea which she presented with settled down with change of insulin. Based on the fact that she had multiple stones, she went on to have an ERCP, which turned out to be a difficult one, and this patient developed severe pancreatitis. So I think it's very difficult for the patient and the relatives to deal with when they know that they had an intervention for which was only picked up by chance and they didn't cause any problem. Uh, and also it's difficult for us to justify that as well. So what do we do at the moment? So first important thing is that this is not an emergency. You have time. The patients are not symptomatic here. So it's important to review the patients, assess if, if they have got any symptoms, review the bloods over the last few months to see if there has been a raised liver enzymes every now and then, and then offer ERCP only if the patient is symptomatic or had altered LFTs. And it's important to have a detailed discussion about this with the patient and the family. The other issue which comes about is that now you found uh, stones but with, through imaging. The patient was symptomatic, patient had cholangitis or as pain. By the time that they came for an ERCP, the patient's symptoms are better. The liver enzymes have started improving. So what do we do in this situation? So you just give an example, a 51 year old who had cholangitis and bilirubin was 91 with obstructive pattern, two stones were seen in the MRCP 
three days later came to the ERCT, but then the patients say the symptoms are all fine now and the liver enzymes have improved. So do you go ahead and do an ERCP in this patient? Well, in this patient, we did, but we learned a lesson. So you can see that there's a fistula on just above the papilla, and both the stones had, had fallen off. Thankfully, this patient did not have any complication. But if you look back, we could have managed this patient something differently. The patient has been well, so the, uh, and the patient has gallstones. This is a young patient. This patient will definitely need a cholecystectomy. So this patient could have gone, we could have canceled the ERCP and say that you need a cholecystectomy. And then based on what we find there, we can decide whether you need an ERCP or not. So, or we could have done an alternative approach. So what we are doing at these, then now with these kind of patients, uh, we are offering an endoscopic ultrasound just before we do an ERCP in the patients who have a low risk uh, for bile duct stones. That is patients in whom imaging had confirmed bile duct stones, but by the time they came for an ERCP, their symptoms are better or their liver enzymes are improving or in situations where the MRI ultrasound had CT had showed that there is a species of stone based on the fact that there is the dilated duct, liver enzymes been slightly altered, and then they thought there were stones, but they were not completely sure on the imaging. Or patient had a cholecystectomy and had an on-table cholangiogram, which showed a tiny stone, but the patient has been well when they came for an ERCP. So all these patients, we do an EUS just before doing an ERCP. And if you look at it, in the sense that we are looking at uh, low risk stones. So the, the, the EUS is very, very, well, relatively very quick because you're only having a focused examination of a bile duct and then you're looking for either one or two stones. And then we found that in majority of the patients, almost close to 50%, patient did not have stones and then we canceled the ERCP. We followed these patients of about 185 patients, which we had for about six months as well after the cancellation to see whether they came back with a cholangitis. And only three patients came back and those were the ones who were waiting for a cholecystectomy or one patient who was deemed not suitable for a cholecystectomy. So years before ERCP is good for this approach. So what, what, how do we manage uh, CBD stones in those who have, so there's not one approach. We have to think about all the different approaches. So. There is a preoperative ERCP in those patients for whom we think might not be suitable for a cholecystectomy uh, or patients who have been really unwell with cholangitis or patients can have, uh, if they've been well, they can go for a lab cholecystectomy and can have an ERCP afterwards. Uh, and there's also an option that as an intraoperatively during cholecystectomy, young patients who have got dilated bile duct and has got a stones can in an experienced time can have a bile duct exploration and stone removal at the same time as well. So they don't need another procedure like an ERCP. Or after the cholecystectomy on table, they can have an ERCP. Or in certain countries like in Sweden uh, or Scandinavian countries, they do a rendezvous techniques. They do a post cholecystectomy, put a wire through the uh, cystic duct and then ERC, somebody catches the wire from the other end and do an ERCP at the same time. So there are different options which you can think of. Now coming to a situation where you've decided that the ERCP is the right option for this patient, in this situation, removing the stones all at one go might not be the option. For example, in some situations where an emergency situation, just draining is the option. For example, patient has got a severe cholangitis, septic, they are in ITU setting, you don't want to spend a lot of time to remove all the stones. So you might, it might be that you want to just put a strength in, drain them, and then come back another day. Or in patients who have got severe cholangitis, but they're on anticoagulants, so you can't do a sphincterotomy or a fistulotomy. So you just have to put a stent and come back. Or patients who are not on propofol, they're just on a sedation, but they're not tolerating. Then again, you have to bail out very, very quickly. But in all of the situations, well, it's just to show this. So this was a patient you can see that patient was on rivaraxaban, had a cholangitis, was septic, hypertensive. Your aim was to just put a stent and come back. So uh, slightly uh, difficult in a way that there is a diverticulum on both sides, but actually when the ampulla is in between the two diverticulums, sometimes it's easier to cannulate. So once we've cannulated it, so we're just putting a pigtail stent in, 
But then again, if you just put one pigtail stent in a situation where you have not done any cut, then, then actually it might get blocked because the bile doesn't drain to the pigtail stent. It's, it drains around the stent. So putting a two stents in situations like this where you have not cut the papilla helps because the bile will drain between two of these stents. Right, so what about the patients who we think that uh, we have decided that this patient needs an ERCP and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the patient is not in an emergency situation? The guidelines suggest that we should be clearing the stones in these patients in about more than 75% in first attempt. So this study we looked at the hospital episode statistics of all the ERCPs in the country for two years. And this showed that the, uh, in about only about 69% of patients had a complete clearance of uh, stones in the first go. So still, majority, uh, still about 30% are having about two or three ERCPs uh, for clearing. So what is our effective stone withdrawal technique? How can we make sure that we clear the stones in the first attempt uh, and without any problems? It's important to understand what's the size of the stone and what's the size and the shape of the bile whether it is completely straight or whether there is any tapering of the duct, and also what is the papillary size of the papillary opening. To understand how much cut you can do at the papillary opening, it's important to understand the morphology of the ampulla. You need to know uh, what is the infundibulum till what is the level you can cut. Sometimes you can't just make it, make it out. When you see the papilla, you have to make a little bit of cut put the sphincterome again in, pull back and reassess and then decide how much you can cut. For example, now I can just show you the, the, the next video of, uh, you can see this, there's a quite a large intraduodenal portion of the bile duct. And here, we are, uh, and this patient had a large stone. So it's, it was important in this that we don't do a small sphincterotomy. Then if you put a, a bigger stone, trying to troll that in a small sphincterotomy, you are going to, cause problems. So it's important that the, the sphincterotomy is very, very effective, but you need to know till where is the limit where you can safely cut. So cut a little bit, put the sphincterum back in, bow it, pull back, reassess to see how much more you have got to cut. Here, I think we've just done, that's the limit. You can't go more than that. That's, uh, and if, uh, so in this situation, we've done it quite a big, uh, sphincterotomy because it was quite a large intraduodenal portion and you can see a large stone was effectively delivered uh, in this case just with sphincterotomy. But in certain situations you might not have a, such a large intraduodenal portions so you might have a smaller uh, uh, spin uh, ampulla but then the uh, you got a larger stone with a dilated duct. In that situations you might have your sphincterotomy and then your sphincteroplasty to the size of the duct so you and then that will be effective technique to remove the stones. Or in situations like you have, uh, uh, where you have a uh, ampulla in the periampullary situations. Here, you, you have to be really careful because the infundibulum is not very marked. You don't know exactly how much to cut. What's the limit of it? So in this situation, it's much more safer to do a small sphincterotomy and a sphincteroplasty, even if you're dealing with the smaller stones. And this is, will be a much more effective technique to remove stones when there is a ampulla in the periampillary in the periampillary diverticular setting. In this situation, now that you've got a large uh, ampulla, you know that there's a stone sitting just underneath that. In this situation, uh, uh, it's much more effective to go for a primary fistulotomy sometimes. So you can see as soon as you cut, yes, there's a stone underneath that. And if you have never done a fistulotomy before, this is these are the right cases to choose because you're not going to cause any harm. You just hit the stone and you're not going to cause pancreatitis. And in fact, in this case, the stone was delivered with the needle. Uh, so you have to look as uh, Cecilia and Jeffra was discussing earlier, you have to look at the morphology of the ampulla and then decide how you tackle them as well. And then once you, we were discussing more about the opening of the uh, ampulla, but then now you have to discuss about how you deal with the uh, stones in the duct, what, what accessories you use. Again, they're both effective using the baskets or 
you have the twist and catch with the medworks. We have the uh, rock star, which is a little tripter, or you can use the balloon. Any of this can be effective, but sometimes uh, using the fluoroscopy, then you can decide what might be helpful. If you have a, a duct wherein a stone is completely flushing the duct and there is no space for the basket to open, then it won't be, baskets will not be effective. For baskets to be effective, you need a duct wherein there is some space between the stone and the duct, like in the first picture you can see. And then when the baskets open, there is space for it to capture the stone. But then in the right side, you can see there's, there's a stack of stones there. It's important to make sure if you're using a balloon in this situation, you don't go up and inflate the balloon and try to get all the stones together. Then you'll stack one over the other and will cause problems. In this situation, it's important that we go in between the stones and then deliver one stone after the other. But then we have some other difficult situations wherein you have a, a conical uh, shaped uh, uh, duct. You've got a bigger stone on the top. You can't do sphincteroplasty to a quite large extent because it's tapered down below. In this setting, you might not be able to capture the uh, stone with a basket because there's not much space at the top. Or in a situation, in the second case, we can see there's a huge boulder there. Or in the third case, we can see that there is a miritsi with a stone from the cystic duct stump, which is pressing on the co common hepatic duct. In these situations, our standard balloon or the basket might not be, uh, may not, may not be effective. In these situations, you might need an electrohydraulic lithotripsy or laser to blast the stones and then, and then use the basket or the balloon uh, to take the stones out. But any of the techniques which we use, whether you're using a basket or a balloon, they are not without complications. So it's important that we know that what complications we can encounter, uh, and especially with a uh, with the basket, because there's a bit of a tip of the basket projecting uh, outside the where the basket is. If you just push the uh, uh, the basket without thinking in the line of the duct, sometimes you can perfect the posterior wall. It's important to remember that. Or sometimes, and like in this case, a very freak uh, a complication which happened. It's important that uh, recognize that this can happen. So this was a patient who had a cholangitis, had a multiple stones. I had taken the first stone out, and now I'm trying to take the second stone out. It's a difficult uh, stones with the arch shape. So I'm using the same manure, tip down, pulling the catheter out, but if I clockwise stop and pushing the scope in, and uh, I did exactly like I did before the previous stone, but then you can see that as soon as I did that, I'm bang, you can see this yellowish, yellowish, I know that I am in the peritoneum now. So what had happened was when I tipped down, the scope hit the lateral wall of the ampulla and then had it caused a perforation while delivering the stone. So now I'm just tipping it back up, looking at the where the opening is. You can see on the right side, that's the defect. Uh, so I'm just taking the ERCP scope out, uh, not to panic, uh, and then just go back with the gastroscope here and then looking with the gastroscope now on the right side, and then using the over the scope clip, uh, which can close up to about two centimeter defects and then closing the opening, uh, closing the defect, and then using the nasal jejunal tube uh, uh, beyond that and to start feeding. And this patient responded well, did not require anything. So it's important to also know what can go wrong and then to be prepared for that. Uh, so that's going to give a bit of an overview of, uh, of the stone management uh, from the case selections to also the technical aspects. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Srisha. Uh, so as you are a slave of time, um, I just make uh, one rapid question that comes from the audience, but it really fits also my, my questions. Uh, when do you perform EUS before? Uh, ERCP uh, if the patient has improved. So you, you, do you do usually uh, in all the patient, even low risk and intermediate risk or, or not? So I think we are fortunate that we have an EUS stacker in the same, uh, in the ERCP room as well, uh, which means that any doubt we can use the EUS before ERCP almost in every case. 
so when the patients has been, even if they have been uh, had a cholangitis, they had a stone, and we have vetted this patient needs an ERCP, but when the endoscopist on the day, when they come to the procedure room on the day, of oh, patient is completely well, jaundice has disappeared, then because we've got a stack on the same room, we, are, we can just we take the EUS scope first, assess it, and then see if there's a stone still there or not before we do an ERCP. But one thing we need to remember that even if you don't have an EUS stacker in the same room, or even if you don't have an EUS facility, if the patient is well on the day the patient comes for an ERCP, please don't do it. So there, it's not an emergency. If the patient is well, we can reassess it. We can, uh, we can rebook another MR, MR, MRCP again if required, or send it for an EUS somewhere else. But what's important is that we don't put a procedure for a patient which is high risk, when patient is well. So ERCP is mainly when the patient is unwell is in a situation. Yeah, I strongly agree. And uh, I really find useful EUS before ERCP. And so uh, this is, I believe, the perfect link to introduce uh, Francesco Di Matteo uh, from Rome, Italy, that is going to talk about uh, EUS solution for hepatobiliary uh, endoscopy and diseases. So uh, the floor is yours, Francesco, and then we hope to have uh, um, another uh, time, few time for uh, questions uh, at the end. Okay, thank you. Hello to everyone. Thank you to SG, to Sushi Film. Uh, thank you to the technical uh, staff. Uh, thank you to, to you, Cecilia, for the underserved introduction. And thank you to the colleagues that gave me an assist to talk about uh, EUS for the pancreatic biliary disease. Um, okay, these are my disclosure. So we were from the colleagues, uh, how is difficult cannulation defined? But how big is the problem? Uh, which are the causes of failed ERCP? It range, the problem ranged from five to 50%. These are the situation commonly used Operator expertise, duodenal diverticulum, papillary stenosis, papilla with redundant faults, impacted stones, neoplasia, and most of all, altered anatomy, gastric bypass, gastrectomy, ruin epsilon, gastro or esophageal digestomy. So, uh, this slide that has been around for a long time, 12 years, is very important because it's uh, depict very um, friendly, uh, which are the routes that we use, hepatogastrostomy, anti-grade drainage, choledocodrodenostomy, or EUS guided rendezvous. I'm gonna talk about the EUS in benign disease. It means uh, uh, for drainage of benign disease. And this is a, a case series, a meta-analysis with a case series in which they perform all the study, they uh, reach all the study in which they perform hepaticogastrostomy or hepaticogigenostomy, and they used to perform stone extraction in the, in the anti-grade manner. So you can see the technical success is 17 to 100%, but the adverse events from 17 to 17%, 60%, sorry. So what, ESG says about uh, endoscopic ultrasound directed transgastric ERCP or EDGE procedure. Uh, they say that can be offered an expert center to patient with a ruin epsilon gastric bypass, following, of course, multidisciplinary decision making, but with the aim of uh, avoid the invasiveness of laparoscopic assisted ERCP or the limitation of enteroscopy assisted ERCP with weak recommendation a low quality of evidence. This is an example. This is not a cystic duct, but an aberrant duct in a young female that is gastric bypass for obesity. So we puncture the excluded stomach with a 22 gauche needle or 90 gauche needle, it doesn't matter, to, uh, to visualize easy the excluded stomach and to put a lamps. And then, or the same day, it depends from the clinical situation, on the day after, we try to pass with a, at the beginning with a gastroscope, 
and then with a dodenoscope to perform a ERCP. So this is the results of what we made. But what say the literature about this uh, an international paper with a, a study, multicenter study that uh, compare US guide gastrogastrostomy assisted DRCP versus enteroscopy assisted DRCP. And what we can see that is a statistically significant difference between uh, these two procedures about technical success, mean procedure time, half time for this procedure, a median length of hospital stay. And what the ESG suggests about use guide rendezvous after a second failure CB in benign biliary disease. This is the procedure. This is the procedure. We perform a cholangiography with a needle, 90 gauge needle, that has a blunt tip to avoid the fraying of the guide wire. We change the instrument, we catch the from the duodenum the guide wire, and we perform the ERCP. Usually at the end, we put always a stent to protect the hole that we made on the common bile duct. But what ESG recommend about US guided good brother drainage? Good brother drainage or percutaneous good brother drainage in patients with high surgical risk with acute cholecystitis as a strong recommendation and high quality of evidence. But now there's another indication as a risky procedure in MBO, in malignant biliary obstruction, in which ERCP and US biliary drainage have failed. And this is an example. This is the new probe from Fujifilm EG740. You can see a 180 degree scanning and deep scanning till six centimeter. This is a gallbladder with a thickening wall with fluid and stones. And you can see the puncture, the delivery of the distal flange, but I want to stress the beautiful image that you can get the, the device exit with this new probe on this area of the instrument. It's very important. The previous one is on this side of the instrument. It means one or two o'clock. But um, this take a cue to say this new transducer as a new technology, single crystal technology that increase the sensitivity and therefore the signal noise ratio. As I told you before, as a greater depth than EG 580 UT and a scanning angle of 180. Again, you can see here a cystic lesion visualized in the very definitely in the depth and this is higher sensitivity. So it means better Doppler image. This is a microflow. Another feature is this, despite the slight larger diameter of this probe, this probe has a smaller radius of curvature. As you can see from this tape, there is a an elegant detail, a green color of the tip is a company color. And you can see easily another feature that is a the elevator that moves at 19 degree. This, the, the US Gold Brother drainage is a rescue therapy for uh, neoplasia, but in this case, uh, the lamps was clogged by food. Even if we put inside a double pigtail, we, we perform a rendezvous, or then a rendezvous by the patent uh, cystic duct. And we put a stent. So a metal stent in a retrograde manner. So what uh, ESG says recommends about the use of a US guide biliary drainage over percutaneous transhepatic biliary drainage in malignant biliary obstruction. There's a strong recommendation in moderate quality of evidence. 
about US guided hepatic gastrostomy for malignant biliary obstruction is deserved just for the dilation in that case in which there's a huge dilation of, of left hepatic duct. In that patient in which ERCP or percutaneous approach failed, this is a weak recommendation, a moderate quality of editing. Uh, this is a nice uh, uh, scheme by Hami Tiber. Cross-sectional imaging, dilating intrahepatic biliary three, anti-grade biliary stent. If failed, hepatic gastrostomy. If failed, rendezvous technique. Non-dilated intrahepatic biliary three, extrahepatic approach. So for the for guaranteed a rendezvous technique and transenteric stent. This is another option, choledoguodenostomy in malignant biliary obstruction. You can see always with a new probe EG740, you can see something that with the previous probe we didn't see so very well. And this is a, another particular, very interesting. Uh, the distance between the exit of the device and the probe is lower. And in this proceeding in particular, it's very important that, that the distance is minor. Because the excursion of the uh, luminoposing metal stent is not so wide. That's, so it's very important that is a, a nice feature that we appreciate a lot. This is the image, the amazing image after the procedure. You can see the relief, the release of in hepatic gastrostomy again with the same probe, uh, huge dilation of the left hepatic duct. Uh, we try to avoid the puncture from the, from the esophagus, of course. This is the picture that resembled the uh, exit of the device of the duodenoscope from Fujifilm. Uh, we perform a cholangiography and then we tried, there was a huge mess here, and then we perform an hepatic gastrostomy with a, by a job bore stent. So new distal layout of the UG740. Um, I've already said that the distance between the ultrasound transducer and the super CCD is lower, and um, it's increased, pardon, and the distance from um, of the needle to the wall target is decreased. Another feature, very nice, is the G lock type guide wire locking system and the elevator locking system. These two blocking system combined are very interesting for the procedure that I showed you before. This is a real great goal from the company. Another feature that we love so much is a broader operating channel. It's a four millimeter operating channel, small resistance to insertion of the biggest device. It means uh, that the resistance is 3.7 Newton meter compared to a 5.5 of the previous probe. And this break down the load that with two guide wires, you have to use a smaller stand. So you can use a guide wire, a 10 French size stand, plastic stand. So to conclude, uh, I'm an array. So the first line, ERCP, okay. Probably second line US, okay. But now we are ready to think about the first line ERCP. For, we got no so evidence in literature, but think about stand patency, think about post, endoscopy pancreatic, uh, pancreatitis, quality of life, uh, in altered anatomy, and uh, it's probably a precedent time saving. So conclusion, US has a pivotal role in therapeutic endoscopy in hepatopancreatic biliary disease. In this field endoscopy, you, of endoscopy, you need to be expert in therapeutic US. And for this purpose, the new EG740 UT probe is a useful tool. Grazie. So thank you so much, uh, Francesco. I fully agree with your 
uh, view. And I have uh, just a question for you. And then if you agree, I, I invite uh, Srisha and Geoffroy to join the last uh, question time. And then uh, we have to close uh, the session. Although there are so many uh, you know, participants, uh, although it's uh, at least uh, 12 o'clock, uh, um, 20, 20 o'clock. So um, do you think that uh, talking about US uh, intervention in the US as first procedure is to launch as you saw in the video or probably it's we are uh, near in the future to uh, to think about the US as first approach interventional procedure obviously we are near by near <laughs> but we cannot say to to the audience that okay. the first line approach could be this honestly because there's not so much evidence in literature Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you trust me. Yeah, I I fully agree. Um, I really want to stress that uh, now, now we think uh, on EUS uh, after um, the um, failure of ERCP. I think there are two key points. So as you mentioned, what is the real failure of ERCP? Because you have to be skilled in ERCP and perform everything that is uh, in your uh, in in your hands to make ERCP works even pre-cut and alternative techniques before uh, you know uh, moving to uh, EUS and uh, second is probably that EUS uh, is uh, uh, can assist ERCP and when this fails we can move to uh, um, a fully um, EUS guided procedure. So um, it's so it's eight o'clock, and uh, there are many questions. I see two raised hands, and uh, I ask uh, to the participant to make the question using the two, the question and answer box. And just one question, because I'm a young endoscopist, and um, when I use a basket, I am uh, a little bit afraid. Uh, of using a basket, uh, especially in difficult bile duct stones, and due to the risk of impaction of the basket. So, suggestion for the expert to the young endoscopy, how you choose and which are the characteristics that you believe uh, suits better in this situation for a basket? Yeah, as, as I uh, slowly, uh, sorry, uh, slightly alluded in my, uh, in my talk, so I personally, this is my, again, my personal view, my personal view, I find baskets useful if the, the duct is big and then there is a, a stone and then there is a gap between the, between the stone and the duct and then there is a space for it to be captured. Or I've used in those, it's the only setting where then there's opens up and then you can capture it. The other setting I've also used it is that the, the duct is so huge that when you put a balloon, the balloon just bypasses the stone. Uh, so the so I've not been able to even use the balloon in that setting because it's so huge. And then there's a small stone sitting there. In that setting, again, I've used the basket to capture it. The uh, the more than the impaction, I think now these the newer ones uh, are quite well designed. Is that even if your stone is getting stuck, then the 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 basket will fragment out. Uh, when you break it. So even if the stone doesn't break, but the, the metal fragments of the basket will, will break out. So in that way, it is well designed. But what I'm sometimes concerned is that when you are, you have to engage the papilla with the basket very, very closer to the ampulla. Uh, but if you're, uh, if you're just pushing it blindly and putting a lot of pressure, then the tip of the basket sometimes can perforate. I know about one or two cases where they've had a uh, complication of that. So it's very important that you engage it very closer and then you tip up to go up. Um, do you, th I really, um, I find very helpful and, you know, I really um, rely on basket that opens as the safety um, tip that opens uh, when the, there is an impacted stones. And uh, do you still perform, obviously, mechanical lithotripsy? And when you switch from uh, um, laser or electrohydraulic intraductal lithotripsy? Yeah, if, uh, if I have to be honest, it's been more than 10 years I've used lithotripsy. 
uh, I think with the advent of uh, uh, spintroplasty, uh, we are picking up much more bigger stones. We are main, able to get them delivered uh, appropriately. Uh, I think the only, uh, and then if that doesn't work, we are going much more quicker into the uh, EHL or laser lithotripsy in the situations where we showed where there is a conical stone and then there's a stone which is there on top where you can't do a sphincterplasty to the size of the duct or where there's a fixed stone because of an inflammation or if it's a malignancy uh, in, in, or uh, in, in these situations, we, we are going for a EHL laser quickly now. So the use of lithotripsy, to be honest, I said I've not used it for the last 10 years. Okay, everything, all the experts agree with that. Okay, I see. Uh, I think, I, I, Cecilia, uh, yeah. I totally agree. I think that uh, the, the sphincteroplasty uh, and the, the macrodilation of the sphincter of OD changed widely our practice in the last, these last years. And finally, the only, I think, uh, the only situation where you have to think about uh, mechanical lithotripsy may, is maybe the, the structure that you find inside the, 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 pan, the pancreatic part of the common bile duct. Because in this situation, when you have the stone above this structure, especially uh, during chronic pancreatitis, you, you think, you say, it is not possible to use the sphincteroplasty, and in this situation, it could be interesting to perform lithotripsy directly. But clearly, the sphincteroplasty has changed a lot of way of management of the, 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 the stone extraction, clearly. And so do you usually use just an extraction basket at the beginning, or the one that is, um, uh, can do uh, lithotripsy as well? in the same uh, um, device uh, and, the, and the use of the guide wire, the um, wire guided, um, usually you do, you use the guide wire um, baskets or not? No, I use directly the, bas the basket and I use it to perform mechanical electricity using a dedicated system, uh, just cutting the, the, the system and, and use the, the the, the, the dedicated system, but um, it, it, it depends also of the consistency of the stone. And sometimes you don't have this response before yeah. to try to, to catch it and to, to, to fragment it, to, to explode the, the stone. So sometimes it is a surprise, not so good. So. <laughs> no, horrible, <laughs> horrible surprise. And okay. So uh, it, we are at least uh, 10 minutes late. Probably it's time to close uh, the session. I don't know if Francesco Di Matteo has something else to say on, uh, on his experience in difficult uh, stones uh, before okay, closing I, the I, session. I agree. Yeah, thank you. Just a few, few things I agree with the colleagues. And I try to use always in a safe manner, uh, the, the basket on the guide wire and ready um, to remove the sheet and to perform mechanical hydrotipsy, uh, uh, rescue uh, extraction. If the size, uh, the anatomy um, um, uh, says us that uh, you get a chance to, to block the stone with a basket, it's better to use immediately something that you can uh, Use in another way okay. uh, for mechanical literacy. Of course, the, the rest is completely, I completely agree with them, of course. Thank you, Francesco. So thank you, thank you, everybody, and to all to the faculty, outstanding lectures. Thank you for all the participants. I have two final remarks before closing, uh, closing, closing the session. Uh, so I want to, all of you invite and remember the, the ESG days uh, 2023 that will be held in Dublin. So see you uh, face to face uh, and uh, web uh, or as an alternative in, uh, so in April. And uh, I would like to thank 
uh, ESG and you know all the and for all the grants and ESG that uh, uh, provide uh, um, for um, you know and all the the membership of ESG for their uh, great great job and really helpful job for all the endoscopists uh, um, as us. And uh, I would like to remind you, remind you uh, the next uh, uh, webinar that will be held uh, uh, the next uh, uh, Wednesday. Uh, at the same time, uh, the chair is uh, Professor uh, Helmut Metzmann that uh, doesn't need any introduction and Professor uh, Sirsema. So uh, thank you very much uh, again. Thank you Fujifilm for uh, so helping us uh, in um, providing this, uh, I hope, educational uh, symposium. Thank you again, ASG, and all of you. Bye, thank have you. a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.